Hi, I'm Greg Lefebvre, and this is The Compulsive Storyteller, a podcast series of short, real, personal stories that prove that truth can be stranger than fiction. In this week's episode, entitled LOL Ha Ha, I share three funny stories, hamster sex, cherry bomb, and falling magician. LOL, ha ha. Hamster sex. I've been teaching for three years in a school in the South Bronx in New York City. All my students are either African American or Hispanic. At the moment, I'm in a parent teacher's meeting with the mother of Terrence Nance. Terrence always comes to class dressed in clean and well-pressed dresses, but they're long and conservative relative to what the other kids wear. Her mother's religious, and I think of her as a church lady, very serious and very devout. She is sitting on the other side of my desk, and Terrence is seated at the end of my desk. And behind her mother, in a glass aquarium, are a pair of hamsters. As we talk about Terrence's excellent grades and behavior, the hamsters begin to mate. The male has mounted the female and is humping her at an incredible speed. Terrence looks horrified, while at the same time doing her best not to laugh at what's going on behind her mother. But the speed with which they're going at it looks straight out of an animated cartoon. Then comes a moment when I can't hold back my laughter, and neither can she. At which point Terrence's mother looks back to behold what's going on behind her. In a quick flash of anger, she turns her attention back to her laughing daughter and me, grabs Terrence by the arm, and briskly drags her out of the classroom, while her daughter looks back at me with just a hint of a smile. Cherry Bomb I'm visiting my friend Eddie Birnbaum at his father's house. We're both 16. His father's a very wealthy Jewish undertaker, and behind their palatial home, there's a little basketball court by the three-car garage where his sister has parked her red MG sports car. Just beyond the car is a very tall, well-manicured hedge, and beyond that, the next-door neighbor's swimming pool where we can hear the mother and daughter swimming in the pool. I'd just returned from a vacation where I purchased some cherry bombs, and I'm showing one of them to Eddie. They're named for the resemblance to a cherry, with a red ball of explosives and a green, waterproof, stem-like fuse. They're outlawed almost everywhere, even in states where firecrackers are legal, because of their explosive potential. They can blow a person's fingers off and permanently damage their hearing or their eyesight if they explode near someone's head. The perfect device for a couple 16-year-old boys to be playing with. As we're standing in the yard, Eddie's dad suddenly appears out of nowhere and asks, What have you got there? We're caught red-handed, so Eddie hands the cherry bomb to his father, who's smoking a cigarette. Without a moment's hesitation, he lights the fuse with his cigarette, and it starts to sputter and smoke. Eddie yells, Dad, are you crazy? That's totally dangerous. It's a bomb. Get rid of it. His father then proceeds to chuck it over the hedge, where it lands in the neighbor's pool and starts to sink. There's a pause before the deafening explosion, which sounds just like a depth charge. The two women scream as if they've been blown apart. Luckily, they're totally unhurt, but incredibly angry. As they come around the hedge, Eddie's dad drops to the ground and flattens himself on the driveway on the far side of the car. The mother starts screaming at us. You boys should be arrested. How could you do something so dangerous and foolish and thoughtless? I'm not going to call the police, but I'm definitely going to talk to your father and insist that you be severely punished, Eddie Birnbaum. I'm so sorry. We weren't thinking and had no idea of how powerful the explosion would be. Well, I'm going in to talk to your father right now. And with that, she heads for the Birnbaum's back door with her daughter in tow. As soon as she enters the house, Eddie's father pops up from behind the MG, laughing hysterically. 
<laughs> I never liked that woman anyway. And thanks to both of you for taking the blame. Now I have to hide in the garage until they both go home. Eddie responds, Dad, you owe me big time. To which his father responds, I totally agree, Eddie. How about I buy you a couple dozen cherry bombs? Falling Magician. I'm living in an artist studio building that's part of an artist building in Waltham, Massachusetts. The ceilings of the studios are 22 feet high, so most have a second story deck and balcony. There are a bunch of different artists living on my hallway, each crazy in their own way. One of the artists living here is a tall, very athletic woman who does massage therapy as her day job. She has a chubby boyfriend named Eric who earns his living as a magician, mostly entertaining at children's birthday parties. He's a very affable fellow with a ready laugh and finds humor in almost all situations. A very refreshing change from most of the other self-involved artists here who are all drowning in their own angst and ennui. I often run into Eric padding around the hallways with a new trick up his sleeve, which he's only too happy to demonstrate. Today, he has a foot-long length of nichrome wire the kind of tightly coiled wire you might find in an old-fashioned space heater. He holds it out stretched between both his thumbs and forefingers, saying, Now watch closely as I concentrate all my energy on the wire, and it will heat up. Miraculously, it slowly turns from black to a faint orange and then a hot orange. It's a very convincing trick. So come on, Eric, how did you do it? He's glad to explain that the wire is painted black from end to end, but when he slowly turns it between his thumbs and fingers, the paint color on the sides of the wire gradually morphs from black to faint orange to hot orange. Such a simple ruse. On the second story of Eric's space, there sits a new pedestal bed, the latest thing in home design, with a flat circular column centered under the sleeping deck that supports the mattress. On Eric's side of the bed, next to the edge of the balcony, overlooking the rest of the loft, is a tall white Japanese paper screen, which provides privacy for their bedroom. On the night in question, Eric and his girlfriend are sleeping in their new bed when she wakes up to go to the bathroom. As soon as she starts to get up, she is no longer counterbalancing Eric's weight, and in a simple seesaw motion, the bed tips toward the edge of the balcony. Eric, still asleep, rips through the rice paper wall and has deposited headfirst onto the stove in the kitchen below, then bounces to the floor, unconscious. His hysterical girlfriend calls an ambulance, which, when it arrives with blaring sirens, wakes up all the other residents of the hallway, including myself. While Eric has lifted onto a gurney, we all peek into their studio and observe the horizontal figure-shaped hole in the rice paper wall above, with Eric's blanket hanging down through the opening. Because the girlfriend is still present, we all do as best we can not to laugh. But the scene we're beholding is as funny as any Looney Tune. As soon as someone loses it and laughs, it's contagious, and all of us can't help but join in, loudly and uncontrollably. Needless to say, the girlfriend is not amused. The next day when I visit the hospital, Eric is lying in bed, wearing a thick neck brace, and is attached to all sorts of monitoring equipment. But true to form, he has a big smile on his face and is demonstrating a magic trick to one of the nurses. Ah, yes, the triumph of the human spirit. Impulsive Storyteller is written and narrated by me, Greg Lefebvre, and co-produced with Peter Kokoma, who's also made our theme song. If you enjoyed this week's episode, we'd love your help sharing the show. Please subscribe to The Compulsive Storyteller for free on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And also, if you could leave a review, that would be fantastic. Follow the show on Instagram, at The Compulsive Storyteller, 
and check out our website for more information at thecompulsivestoryteller.com. Thanks for listening, and if you don't like this one, the next one will be another story. The characters and events portrayed in this podcast are based on my truth, with some names and facts changed for privacy. All conversations and dialogues are based on my best memory, but are not word-for-word recreations.